certain that it is an incomparable experience, something that unless you're on board, you can't possibly understand what it really feels like. Um, Paul, and I'm confident that you and I cannot do it justice even attempting to tell everyone joining us today about it. So instead, we have invited Axiom Space's own commander, Michael Lopez Alegria, to share from his previous experiences. LA, MLA, or commander, you've got a few designations, right? <laughs> <laughs> For those who, who may not know, How you doing, Paul, good to see you, Ronnie. Hey, it's good to see you as well, sir. Thank you for joining us this morning. Yeah, good to be with you. So, for those who may not know, uh, I've got to uh, share a few stats here just to make sure people understand who we have joining us today uh, on the show. <clears throat> You've flown to space six times, two of those to Dragon, uh, uh, on Dragon for Axiom Space. You've Got a running total of, say, 296 days, 16 hours, and 15 minutes, give or take or so, in space. You've conducted 10 EVAs over the course of your career, and when you're not in space, you're helping get others at Axiom Space to space, right? As our chief astronaut. Do I have all of that right? Sounds good. I'm not sure about the minutes and seconds, but everything else sounds right. That's awesome. Well, we want to spend some time with you and just ask you some questions about your experiences getting to the International Space Station. Uh, obviously, you know a thing or two about rendezvous and docking. Um, so the first question is simply, we've just watched Dragon Grace dock to the space station. You've done this several times. What's the mindset for a crew at this point in the mission? So as we get closer and closer, you know, we're transitioning from the, the phase where you're um, basically waiting to get to the ISS and your laser focused, especially the last 220 meters from what they call waypoint one into docking. A lot of focus on what's being shown on the displays. Um, we have several parameters that we're monitoring, closure rate, the uh, what they call the corridor, et cetera. There are a few things that could cause the system to stop or retreat or even break out, which means you'd come back and try to rendezvous on another day. So that's really what's going on, at least uh, technically, I guess, in your mind. Obviously, emotionally, it's a completely different story. You know, you've been in there, in these case, uh, th their cases, they've been in there for, you know, almost 30 hours uh, since launch. Uh, not a ton to do. And so uh, they're very eager, I'm sure, to get aboard the ISS and start working. So for you, on your missions, uh, say AX-1 and AX-3, what was this moment of, of the anticipation of the hatch opening? What was that like for you and your crew? You know, like a lot of space flight, it's very busy and you're trying to juggle a couple of different emotions. I mean, obviously one is uh, you've got a lot to do. They're getting out of their suits, they're putting on their flight suits to get across, they've got some reconfiguration of the onboard systems to take care of. So on that plane, you know, you're sort of focused on the task at hand. But uh, secondarily, you're thinking, again, a lot about, uh, you know, what it's taken to get here, uh, what, it, what is this going to be like when I float aboard the ISS for the first time. So there's an emotional component that is also pretty strong. A lot going on. So backing up even further, before you get to that kind of emotional moment of crossing the threshold, um, tell me a little bit more about the journey to get to that point. We on this end get to see launch, ascent, and then spacecraft separation. But after that, as you mentioned, you're kind of on your own. What are some of the hallmarks of your transit up to the station? Yeah, as you know, Ronnie, uh, from the time of post-orbital insertion when the Dragon is configured for on-orbit operations until you really start the approach initiation, you're basically playing catch-up. And I heard it greatly or very well explained by John uh, yesterday on the broadcast during launch that it's basically you're on the same lane as the ISS, but now you've got to catch up. And the way we catch up is by having an orbit with a lower altitude than the ISS. So we actually go around the Earth a little bit faster each time. And with each lap around the Earth, we get closer and closer. And so there's not a ton to do. Those uh, maneuvers to adjust the orbital altitude, we call them burns. They happen, um, first of all, automatically. Of course, we are monitoring when they're going on. But between those things, there's not a ton to do. The Dragon is a very uh, efficient air, uh, air spacecraft for uh, what it is meant to do, which is transit to get you from the Earth to the ISS. But it's not really cut out to be an on-orbit anything, really. So you're just sort of hanging out, 
they'll have a, or they will have had a sleep period uh, while they wait to get there. But there isn't a ton to do between those maneuvers, and so uh, it's really kind of a hurry up and wait. Again, a lot like a lot of human spaceflight, very intense activities, followed by some pretty long lulls occasionally. And so then when do you get to go from that free-flying, like, transit mode to the rendezvous and docking <clears throat> phase? Yeah, so after that series of uh, maneuvers to change the altitude, we start approach initiation. And I would say that the transition is, is really when the spacecraft starts pointing at the ISS. Until then, the attitude is really optimized for power and communications considerations. But when it gets um, beyond a certain point, it starts actually looking at the ISS. And then you start being able to pick it up in the displays through the forward-looking cameras that are on board. L.A., you've described um, the moment of getting into microgravity as you've, you've transitioned into another plane, another world, another moment. Can you share a little bit of that thought, that mindset, uh, as you transition from, obviously, the acceleration of launch into microgravity and being in that other world? I'd love to hear your perspective on that transition. Yeah, you know, Paul, it's it's interesting. I mean, the uh, it really is kind of like a parallel universe in a way. You, we all live our lives in 1G pretty much our entire lives. Uh, but when you make that transition, it, it really is a, a very different sensation. For the first time you feel it, it you can't even believe it. I mean, it it's a little bit like the zero-G airplane that we are trained in. But of course, instead of lasting 20 seconds or so, it lasts effectively forever. And so that sensation, I mean, it just brings a smile to your face when you let go of something and it just stays hovering in front of you. Um, I, and it's, it just never gets old. It's really quite remarkable. I love it. Uh, and obviously our crew in Dragon right now is in that other plane, in that other world of, of microgravity being constant. Um, <clears throat> so we're walking forward. We're, we're progressing towards this moment where the hatch will open and they are going to enter the uh, space station. You, you've mentioned this already a little bit, but I'd love to just kind of unpack that some more. What is it like to just kind of float through that hatch and, and realize you're no longer in Dragon, you're now in the station? Yeah, think about the uh, experience that these guys have had. I mean, they've been training in the mock-ups that look just like the ISS, but you're obviously walking around in there, you're not floating. So now they've experienced microgravity, but in the fairly confined spaces of the spacecraft. Once the hatch is open, it, it's a special moment. And you, the, as a commander, you really never get to see it, because generally they go in first. But you can just feel their uh, wonder as they float across the hatch. And they are actually in that environment that, on the one hand, looks so familiar, but in a different way feels very different, because now you're floating and not walking through it. It's a similar experience, and I remember uh, on AX-1 when the three uh, first-time flyers saw the Earth from the first time from the Dragon spacecraft after we got into orbit. And again, I didn't see their faces because they were glued to the windows, but I could just feel, hear, and sense how excited they are, and it's, it's, a, it's a magical feeling. And I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, to trying to perceive what that must be like for these three as they float aboard the ISS. One of the things we're really looking forward to with this crew is the welcome ceremony that's going to be today <clears throat> at 8.35 a.m. Central. Um, tell us a little bit about the history or the tradition associated with welcoming a new crew on board. Yeah, that goes back, uh, obviously, 25 years or so when the, uh, we first started having hand or handovers aboard the ISS. But recently, what we've done is uh, added a pinning ceremony to that. And that is where Peggy, as a commander, will provide uh, astronaut pins to the three new flyers, uh, Shook, Suave, and Tibor. And those pins will have a number associated with them, which is the number of, of orbital astronaut they are. So they will be the 634th, 35th, and 36th humans to have orbited the Earth in the history of humanity. So when you think about it, it's a pretty small number considering, you know, humans have been around quite a while. But it's pretty nice and, of course, to be greeted by the onboard crew, uh, all seven of them, lots of hugs, lots of different languages being spoken, and a lot of smiles. And 
So then after you have this great welcome moment, sharing all of that across different cultures, different teams, how quickly do you transition then to working together on station? Pretty quickly. Uh, you really have to hit the ground running. There are a few safety things that we go through with the ISS commander where they'll tell us some things that, of course, they have learned in the mock-ups again, but now th this is for real. These are where things are located. This is what we expect you to do if this or that goes wrong. And then, really, it's, uh, it's off to work. We start transferring a lot of cargo out of the ISS. Most of that will be to support uh, various scientific experiments that we're bringing on board. And, uh, and then our lives get ruled by what we call the Optimus Viewer, which is basically a moving map of your schedule from um, the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. Uh, and it's pretty hectic. You know, you've got, in this case, 14 days to get a lot of stuff done. Every detail is pre-programmed by the teams on the ground working with NASA. And we really have a, 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 an effort to try to maintain that pace. Uh, obviously, it takes a bit of time to get accustomed to floating around, even though they've been in zero G for over a day. They haven't been in zero G in such a big uh, open space. And so moving around, you've heard the term uh, or the phrase, slow, smooth, and smooth is fast. Uh, they definitely will be practicing that. So there's a little bit of time for adaptation. There's quite a bit of time with the safety briefings that I mentioned. But after that, it's uh, looking at uh, Optimus Viewer and really getting started. LA, you've just mentioned that that schedule is full and you jump right on into it, uh, trying to stay ahead of that red line uh, in that Optimus map you mentioned. But I'm curious, just looking back at, at AX3, your previous mission, what were some of the highlights for you personally on board the space station? We've learned a lot since uh, AX1 and the progression through AX3. And I think one of the things we learned is that we really need to focus the commander's time on being available to the other crew members. So I would say one of the most gratifying things is giving them the time and space to sort of inhale, exhale, uh, think about what they're doing, and take their time. Because really, the planners have done a great job fitting all of these activities into these 14 days. And there is enough time to do it. It doesn't uh, do anybody good to get flustered and, and upset. You just uh, go one step at a, time, at a time. And then letting them have a little bit of time to look out that window, because that is a view that is a spectacular and unforgettable. Um, I think my advice to the crew would be you have a huge responsibility. Your families, your colleagues, your space agencies, your nations are really counting on you. But at the same time, Try to enjoy it. Try to really soak this in. This is generally a once in a lifetime opportunity. And again, it's that balance between, you know, sort of the focused, hard nails, technical work and trying to really absorb the emotional experience, which is obviously very unique. Unique indeed. Um, you just mentioned uh, there that there's lessons to be learned that you share out um, with each of the crew members. And I know that you got a chance to do that with this crew um, and ahead of their launch, I believe, in, in quarantine. Um, so I'm curious if, if you could share some of those lessons learned with us. If, if, we were, if you were preparing to take us up next, what, what would you share with us? Well, the good news is that, uh, you know, Peggy has done this time or two herself, and uh, her crew will probably be as ready as anybody, anyone that you can imagine. So my time with this crew was pretty short and pretty informal because of, A, her experience, and, B, the training that, as I mentioned, has evolved since AX1 to the point that I think we have it pretty well suitcased in terms of what to train, what not to train, and, and how much of each. Um, again, my advice to them is try to absorb it, try to um, be as cognizant of what's going on because it, it is that parallel universe, again, that's hard to get to. And the, the more of that you can sort of soak away in the recesses of your mind, the better. Because I, I'm quite convinced that uh, this crew in particular is extraordinarily well trained and they'll have no issue getting through their timeline and all their activities that they have to do. I just want them to think about the stuff that they can do and take advantage of the amazing experience that they're having. Commander, thank you so much. We truly could spend the next hour talking space with you. Um, thank you for sharing your time and your perspectives with us this morning. You bet, it's been a pleasure. All the best.